right now I'm talking about the origins and evolution of uh, PEM, the first slide. And the first time I heard about uh, PEM was from Dr. Melvin Ramsey, who was an infectious disease physician at the London Royal Free Hospital in 1955 when there was an outbreak of a disease among the hospital staff, the nurses and the physicians, interestingly, but not the patients. And he described the disease he saw, naming it myalgic encephalitis, or ME. So the main feature of ME, as he saw it, was, and this is the quote, muscle fatigability, whereby even after a minor degree of physical effort, three, four, or five days or longer elapse before full muscle power is restored. Without it, I would be unwilling to diagnose a patient as suffering from ME. It is most important to stress the fact that cases of ME of mild or even moderate severity may have normal muscle power in a remission. In such cases, tests for muscle power should be repeated after exercise. Dr. Ramsey also spoke about how these symptoms can fluctuate daily within a patient, that cognitive exertion can cause these symptoms, and that if people continue to push despite having these symptoms, they could go on to have chronic unremitting symptoms. Now I'm going to go over in the next few slides, the evolution of PM over the last 60 years. But keep in mind Dr. Ramsey's definition, and while I'm going through the various definitions, you may want to think about how they're similar or not and how they overlap or not. So for the next three decades, at least in the U.S., there was not a lot of uh, talk about um, ME until the mid-1980s when enough that the government convened a panel of clinicians and researchers headed by Gary Holmes in 1988 and came out with what was called the Holmes Criteria. They named the illness chronic fatigue syndrome at the time because they weren't clear about the etiology and they judged that fatigue was the most prominent symptom. So the Holmes Criteria required that people have chronic disease. Twenty-four hours or greater generalized fatigue after levels of exercise that would have been easily tolerated in the patient's pre-morbid state. Uh, and this definition was used for a number of years, but some clinicians were concerned because they thought that uh, it would recruit subjects with more psychiatric illness. That was one of the concerns. So in 1994, Another panel was convened headed by Kenji Fukuda, and this is where the Fukuda case definition comes from. As many of you know, Fukuda is the most used criteria internationally and in the U.S. for both clinical care and research, and requires, again, chronic disabling fatigue, and four out of, 11, four out of eight optional symptoms. And one of the four is, uh, out, of, out of the eight, is a post-exertional malaise lasting more than 24 hours. Now it's interesting to me, this is the first official mention of the words post-exertional malaise that I see, but also they don't really describe in the original Fukuda paper what post-exertional malaise is. It's a pretty vague term and malaise itself is not really a technical term in medicine. So this prompted um, in 2001 in one of their papers, Lenny Jason King et al. wrote in quotes, no clear operational definition of this symptom, meaning PM, exists, end of quote. So for that reason, and also for other reasons, um, for example, a lot of experienced clinicians and researchers felt that the Fukuda criteria, on the one hand, uh, was too vague, but on the other hand, it didn't describe enough the symptoms their patients, they were seeing in their patients, they decided in 2003 to come together again and come up with another case definition, and this is the Canadian Consensus Criteria, the CCC, which requires, besides fatigue, some uh, post-exertional malaise and or fatigue, and that's described as, in these quotes, inappropriate loss of physical and mental stamina, rapid muscular and cognitive fatigability, post-exertional malaise and or fatigue and or pain, and a tendency for other associated symptoms within the patient's clusters of symptoms to worsen. There's usually a slow recovery period and which lasts 24 hours or longer. 
Now this is a more specific and more detailed uh, explanation of PEM, but it still leaves some questions in my mind. For instance, you have the phrase and or fatigue and or pain, and so that could be a little confusing to both clinicians and researchers. Going on, as many of you know, in 2011, another group of clinicians and researchers again, some of whom were present in 2003, came out with the Myalgic Encephalitis International Consensus Criteria, or the MEICC. And um, you know, the MEICC doesn't require fatigue per se, but it does require a symptom called post-exertional neuroimmune exhaustion, or PENE. And there are five symptoms that characterize PENE. I put down here. It's a marked rapid physical and or cognitive fatigability in response to minimal exertion, exacerbation of a variety of symptoms, and the examples they gave were flu-like symptoms and pain. Um, this PENE could occur immediately or it could be delayed by hours or days after the trigger, and it usually lasted 24 hours or longer. And because of this low threshold of fatigability, it resulted in substantial reduction in activity level uh, for many patients. So again, this is a more detailed and more specific explanation, but one of the concerns in my mind is, again, you have five different characteristics, and it's not clear from the MEICC whether you need all five characteristics or if you only need one or if you need three. While all of this was going on, uh, the Centers of Disease Control was watching, and they amended their website. I'm not really sure when. It was after 2010, and I think it was around 2012, but I might be wrong there, to say instead of just post-exertional malaise and the description from Bakuda, to say now that it was increased malaise, meaning extreme exhaustion and sickness, following physical activity or mental exertion. So the gist of all this is there were a lot of changes over the last 60 years, and we went from um, there was a lack of definition in the beginning, uh, and it was unclear, and it evolved over time. But we're still left with a diversity of, of definitions for PEM. And these next two slides, I'm actually not going to go into great detail on because um, it's rather complicated, but I will point out a few things so you can look at it on your own if you wish afterwards. I'm also going to try the pointer here, so let me see if I can get this to work. Uh, Okay, so can you see my red dot? Um, that's the pointer. And on the top row, what you're seeing there are the different case definitions that I covered. Ramsey, Holmes, Fakuda, CCC, and MEICC. And then here on the column on the left-hand side are the different characteristics. So I'm just going to take one. I've highlighted in red cognitive exertion. So what you see is the Ramsey definition, he had said yes, cognitive exertion can cause PEM or PEM-like symptoms, but in Holmes it's not specified. In Fakuda initially there's no mention of cognitive exertion, and now there is um, on their website, and in the CCC and the MEICC in both cases they did talk about cognitive exertion causing symptoms. This is similar to the prior slide. And I'm going to pick again on in just one area. So which of these definitions talks about symptoms other than physical fatigue? In the Ramsey definition, he focused on muscle fatigability. In Holmes, the words used were just prolonged generalized fatigue, so they didn't talk about other symptoms. Bakuda uses the word sickness um, currently uh, on their website, and that's still pretty vague in my mind. And as stated earlier, the CCC and the MEICC are the most detailed in terms of talking about symptoms like uh, sore throat, pain, um, influenza-like symptoms, other than just fatigue. Okay, so now we come up to around 2014, and the Department of Health and Services asked the Institute of Medicine to come up with a clinical case definition for MECFS that could be used easily by clinicians in practice. Um, even though the audiences include patients and researchers, our primary audience were uh, practicing uh, clinicians, and so we were putting, we were put the, given the task of looking at different symptoms, and in my mind, we were reconstructing PM and also updating it based on the newer evidence that had come out. 
there are three types of evidence that we look at to come up with our definition. The first was clinician experience, the second were patient reports, and the third were studies. And these studies are detailed in the section on PEM in Chapter 4 of the IOM book. I'm not going to talk about every study because I don't have time, but I'm going to focus on a few to give you some examples. And the studies that um, we focused on were ones where some type of stressor was applied, where patients reported symptoms or MECFS subjects reported symptoms, and they were compared to controls, and where some type of objective outcome was measured as possible and then linked to those symptoms. So the first type of evidence is clinical experience. Um, we drew from the prior case definitions that I just went through, which were based a lot on um, uh, clinician experience. Uh, as many of you know, half of the Institute of Medicine Committee were composed of MECFS specialists and uh, researchers. So they contributed their years and thousands of patients' experience to the discussions. In addition, there were people that were less experienced with MECFS but had lots of experience taking care of patients without it, with other medical conditions. So they could provide um, a context upon which to compare these patients. And finally, many of you saw um, the public presentations that were made last year. Uh, and as you saw, Drs. Jason, uh, Dr. Gudrun Lange, and Dr. Afumi Kishi uh, talked about their respective um, clinical areas. The second type of evidence we looked at were patient reports. And I want to uh, thank the hundreds of patients out there who sent in comments to the Institute of Medicine. We read every single comment as committee members, um, and this is a representative comment. So this person wrote in, when I do any activity that goes beyond what I can do, I literally collapse. My body is in major pain. It hurts to lay in bed. It hurts to think. I can't hardly talk. I can't find the words. I feel my insides are at war. My autonomic system is so out of whack, I can't see farsighted, and glasses won't help. Only rest. My GI system is so messed up, my body jerks, the list goes on. There are days that I just want to cry because I can't take care of myself. I need help. So what does this comment tell us? I sort of highlighted in red some areas um, that I think this comment addresses. The first is that these symptoms were brought on by um, exertion, by activity. Secondly, that uh, the symptoms experienced were more than just pain and fatigue. Um, this person mentioned problems with their thinking, their autonomic system, their gut. The symptoms are severe enough that this person can't take care of themselves and their personal needs. And that finally, it lasts for a duration of days and not just a couple hours. Um, so those are some of the things we took from such a comment. Another source of patient reports were the FDA Voice of the Patient report. And these are just some representative uh, quotes and areas that people talked about. Uh, PEM triggers were things that people could normally undertake. And people said they had out of proportion reactions to not just exertion, but to things like poor sleep, infections, weather changes, upright positioning, emotional distress, massage. Uh, for some people, their PEM started within a few minutes of an activity. For others, it started days after. They had difficulty recovering strength or ex energy following exertion, and this could last for days, uh, weeks, months, years, depending on the trigger. Other features that people noticed was that it was unpredictable and that it could vary within themselves as well as it could vary in severity and the type of symptoms between people. And finally, there was a quote from someone that lots of smaller triggers can build up over time and cause a bigger crash. And when I read this, it reminded me of what Dr. Ramsey had written about accumulation of smaller triggers and what could happen over time. So those were some patient reports that we uh, guided our um, look at PEM. The third branch of evidence are studies. And here I'm going to cover six individual studies and then a group of studies that looked at a repeated cardiopulmonary exercise testing. So the first study was by Black and colleagues in 2005. And this study uh, gave us some information about triggers and onset of PEM. So um, trying this again. And oh, wrong slide. OK. 
So they took two groups of subjects. One group had CFS, the other group were healthy controls, and then they strapped activity monitors on all these subjects and they had them walk. And they measured their walking. This is the bar showing um, the initial walking. And these are activity counts. So it's not steps per day, but it, the higher up the number, the more active someone is. So they did that for both groups. And then they asked them to increase their walking by 30% from baseline for uh, initially. And this is the red box that you see here. So this is the additional walking that the CFS subjects and the control subjects did. So what was interesting is four to ten days after they started doing this, the CFS subjects declined in the amount of walking they were able to do, whereas in the control subjects, they were able to keep it up more or less. So what does this study illustrate? It illustrates that something as mild as increasing your walking can cause problems for CFS patients, that there's a delayed onset. They were able to initially increase their walking, but then they couldn't keep it up days later. And that this is the study was interesting. It's more than just asking patients about or subjects about their symptoms, but rather it's about keeping their activity count. You can see that there's a decline over time. The second study I'm looking at is by Van Ness and researchers in 2010. And this study provided us with some information on PEM uh, symptoms, their um, severity, and the duration. So once again, we have two groups of subjects. There's a control healthy group and a group with CFS. And what these researchers asked, they asked all subjects to get on a bike and to bike up to a certain level. And then after that, they asked them to record how they felt every day for seven days. They then took their stories and they grouped them by symptoms and they looked at this. So here on the y-axis, these are the number of subjects. There are about 20 people in the control group, and there were about 20-something in the CFS group. In the x-axis, 1, 2, 3, 1 through 9, you can see here's a legend, and there are different symptoms. So for example, symptom 4, the number 4 stands for uh, cognitive issues, number 8 stands for insomnia, and number 9 stands for sore throat and swollen glands. And this little 3D axis you see coming here, the first row refers to symptoms right after biking, the second row to 24 hours after biking, and the third row uh, to symptoms 48 hours after biking. So what are the differences? What does this chart tell us? Well, in the control group, you can see that some symptoms like cognitive issues, sore throat, um, insomnia, none of them had these symptoms. But in the CFS group, you can see there was a wide range of symptoms besides just fatigue, which was number one, and pain. Uh, secondly, if you look at the pattern of symptoms, the control group, they mostly had symptoms right after biking, so this first row. If you look at the second row or the third row, there really weren't that many symptoms. In the CFS subjects, there's an interesting pattern. For example, let's look at cognitive dysfunction. Um, five or so people had it. The immediately after biking, but then 24 hours and 48 hours, you have more people saying they continue to have symptoms. And this is reflected in when the, sub, in when the researchers asked their subjects how long it took them to recover. 60% of the people who had CFS said it took five or more days for them to recover, but almost all of the healthy subjects recovered within 24 hours. In addition to that, 0% of the CFS subjects said they felt better after biking, and 75% of the healthy folks said, yeah, they felt better. So there's a difference. One thing I'm not able to capture in this picture are the severity of symptoms. But the researchers asked their subjects, how severe was it? So even though you had a bunch of people who were healthy saying, yes, I felt more fatigue after biking, it was something they recovered from fairly quickly, and it was reasonably mild. In the CFS subjects, you have people saying they weren't able to take care of themselves the day after. Or they just didn't feel well for many days. So there was a difference in degree. This third group of study, third study I want to talk about is by Nieges et al. in 2010. And they looked at the effect of physical activity on pain. Um, and so let's see if I can get this to work again. Okay. 
So the solid line here refers to healthy, non-active people, people who aren't particularly physical act, physically active. And the dashed line refers to people with ME-CFS. So what did they do? They had all these folks get on a bike and then had them bike to two different limits. The first was when up to a limit where the researchers said, OK, now you can stop biking. And then the second test a week later was when the subjects could tell the researcher, I'm starting to feel bad. Can I stop now? So they, they underwent two different exercise conditions. And you can see here in the x-axis, they measured pre-exercise and post-exercise what happened. Again, there's pre-exercise, post-exercise. Now, what did they measure? This device here is called an algometer. And what it does is it pushes on people's skin, in this case, the subject's legs. And at some point, the pressure turns into pain. And this is called the pain pressure threshold. So they keep pushing this device onto the person's skin until the person says, ouch. And what you can see here is the amount of pressure it takes to cause pain. So the higher the amount of pressure, the higher the pain threshold. The lower the amount of pressure, the lower the pain threshold. And what you see here is the CFS subjects and the healthy subjects start out with approximately the same pain pressure threshold pre-exercise. But post-exercise, the CFS subjects, now it takes less pressure to cause them to have pain. Whereas in the healthy subjects, it takes more pressure. So there's a different, a paradoxical effect in the CFS subjects compared to the healthy subjects. And they saw this both when the people were biking under the researcher determined limits. Same pattern here again, start out approximately the same level. CFS subjects drop, healthy subjects go up. So there's definitely a difference in how people respond to physical um, exertion in this study. Now one thing I can't show you on these um, charts is they not only looked at the pressure on people's legs, they also looked at pressure on their hands and pressure on their back. And that's interesting to me because you think, okay, they're biking. You expect the leg muscles to be affected and pain to be affected. But how about the back and the hand, which aren't really being exercised when you're biking? Well, they found the same patterns. So that's interesting. It just occurs to me that you know, um, when you look at healthy people or even people with other illnesses and they exercise, they may have increased pain in the exercise parts of their body. But in CFS subjects, you get this generalized um, effect, and it's not just the part that was exercised. The fourth study comes from um, Togo and Benjamin Nadelson's group in 2011. And this is a group that looked at the effect of physical activity on sleep. And so, um, oops, OK. I have these pictures here of women. And the reason why they're of women is because the study was entirely uh, female uh, subjects. It didn't have any male subjects in it. So what did they do? They again had a group of healthy subjects and a group of subjects with CFS. They had everyone come into the lab and sleep as they would at, like they would at home and they were, had a sleep study done that evening. Then the next day, they had all the subjects get on a bike and bike to a certain degree. They had the subjects go to sleep again in the lab, did a second sleep study. So they had sleep studies done twice. Other than sleep studies, they asked people four times um, the night before they slept, the morning after they slept, this evening, and then the night after they woke up, or the morning after they woke up here, to rate their sleepiness, fatigue, and pain. And what they found was, I've highlighted in red here, in the healthy folks and the folks with MECFS who said, after I sleep, I feel less sleepy, the exercise helped improve the continuity of their sleep, deep sleep, and efficiency. But in the folks with CF, and also reduced their sleepiness and fatigue in the morning the, after the bike ride. So exercise helped their sleep. But in contrast, the uh, CFS subjects who said, I'm more sleepy after I sleep, uh, exercise didn't help them. There was no change in continuity or efficiency or sleepiness or fatigue. So what does this study tell, uh, tell us? Well, it tells me that you can't just lump all ME-CFS subjects together and analyze them as a group. You may, may need to separate them on how much or if they have symptoms at all in a particular area. Um, this is especially important if you're using uh, certain case definitions like FACUDA, 
where sleep is an optional, sleep issues are an optional symptom and they're not required. Okay, study number five. This is by Cockshell and researchers in 2014 and it looked at cognitive exertion um, effects and the duration of, again, uh, post-exertional malaise. So what Cockshell did is, as all the other researchers, she had two groups. There was a CFS group, which is the top line here, and a healthy control group, which is the bottom line. And all of them were required to undergo a neuropsychological testing battery that lasted um, over three hours. And at various times, at the beginning of the testing, in the middle, up to 24 hours after, they asked the subjects to rate their degree of mental fatigue. So lower down on the scale, less mental fatigue. Higher up on the scale, more mental fatigue. You look at the CFS subjects, and at every time point, they had more mental fatigue. That in itself is not surprising. What's interesting is in the healthy controls, at the beginning, their fatigue to some degree, because they had undergone some other testing already. Um, but by 24 hours after this test, they were back down to where they were, more or less. With the CFS subjects, they started out here, and 24 hours later, they were still elevated to some degree. And this is also represented in when Cockshell asked the subjects how long it took them to recover entirely to baseline. The healthy folks recovered within seven hours after the test, whereas the CFS subjects took uh, 57 hours. So that's a huge difference. It's 50 hours difference, two days. Study number six was by oops, Capron and the Centers for Disease Control in 2006. And here again, they looked at the effects of cognitive exertion. And this time, instead of just looking at uh, symptoms like mental fatigue, they looked at performance on certain um, tests. And th they use a computerized test. And one of the tests they looked at is, uh, let me see if I can get this to show up here. Oops. OK. It was called Rapid Visual Information Processing, or RVIP. So these are people who had a, some sort of stimulus on a computer screen, and then they would respond to it. They had three groups. Oops. For some reason, this whenever I try to use my, power, my pointer, it tends to skip a slide. They had three groups. So this first group here are CFS subjects with uh, pretty severe mental fatigue. Second group were CFS subjects without severe mental fatigue. And the last group were non-fatigued subjects. On the y-axis here, this is uh, how long it took them to respond to the computer stimulus in milliseconds. And the lower down on the, on the y-axis it is, the quicker they responded. The higher up on the y-axis, the longer it took them to respond. And these three bars, this is beginning test, middle of the test, end of the test. What they found was in the CFS subjects with significant mental fatigue, the time to respond increased significantly from the beginning of the test to the end of the test. They didn't see the same pattern in the CFS subjects without significant mental fatigue, and they didn't see it in the uh, controls either. So uh, people are uh, getting something in response, they're getting more fatigued in response to the exertion that's showing up in the um, time it takes them to respond. And they saw this not only with this specific test in information processing, but also in working memory. So what does this study tell me? It tells me that, again, you have to not just look at all subjects with CFS and lump them together, but separate them out, perhaps, by uh, other symptoms that seem to significantly affect them. In this case, the CFS subjects with mental fatigue versus those with less mental fatigue. Okay, this is a really complicated slide, and I really wish I had a better way to show it, but let me walk, talk you through this. Um, these are a bunch of studies that looked at cardiopulmonary exercise testing. That's two exercise tests separated by 24 hours. And what these studies told us was physiologically how do CFS subjects um, recover after they've been submitted to physical activity. So the top row here, maximal threshold oxygen uptake, maximal threshold workload, anaerobic threshold oxygen uptake, anaerobic threshold workload, these are the measures that the researchers took. And I'm not going to go into detail about what they mean, but I do want you to be able to understand 
uh, what the results were. The column here, these are the four different studies that looked at it and the years the studies were published. So which, let's take a cell, one of these cells, okay? So what they're doing, these researchers, is they're comparing the results on the second day of the test to the first day of the test. So here, for example, you have CFS subjects, and on the second of the day of the test, their numbers are 22% less. This is a negative sign, 22% less than the first day. And if you look all over this chart, you'll see all the numbers um, are negative. So in every instance, the CFS subject did worse on the second day than on the first day. Now some of these cells I've highlighted in red, and they're all more than 7%. And the reason why I did that, there's a lot of studies showing that healthy, as well as people with other medical conditions, they are able to replicate the test. So their, less, their difference is less or equal to 7%. But in CFS subjects, you can see there are several instances, 22%, 26%, up to 55% difference. The difference is much more than what you would expect, than 7%. It's a lot more. Secondly, this whole table are based on CFS subjects. And I didn't do a second table for healthy people. But the researchers found in some instances that healthy people improved their measures on the second test. So instead of negative numbers like I have all over here, some of them were positive for the healthy people. And the last point here is some of these researchers, they used physiological measures to confirm that all their subjects were performing at maximum level. So it wasn't an issue of, oh, their numbers are less on the second day because they were not putting in enough effort. They were using objective tests and objective measures to say this person is performing biologically at 100% of what they could do. So these next two slides, again, I'm not going to go into great detail on, but they're summarizing some of what I spoke about earlier. And if you're going to take one thing from this slide, it's, it's basically um, that the, uh, there are differences in how MECFS subjects react to activity versus healthy people. And you can see on the top column, on the column on the left, I have fatigue, pain, sleep, and various symptoms. And on the top row, it's MECFS subjects versus healthy or sick controls. Just quickly here, focusing on the uh, word that I highlighted in red, mood there. I did not cover studies on mood in this presentation, but we did look at three studies that looked at the effect of physical exertion on mood. And in the MECFS subjects, they, the researchers found worsened mood or mood disturbances, whereas in healthy people, um, their mood actually improves with physical activity. And as many of you may know, um, in uh, people with depression and anxiety of, of a mild to moderate severity, uh, activity is often prescribed as a first-line treatment to help mood. Um, so it's the opposite of its effect that we saw in uh, MECFS subjects. Okay, so the Institute of Medicine Committee, we were also asked to comment on the prevalence of uh, MECFS, uh, PM in MECFS, and whether it was unique. We found that about 70 to 100 percent of adults with MECFS said they experienced PM around the same number, 70 to 97 percent or so in kids. When the same question was put to healthy adults, the number was 2 percent to 19 percent, um, with the lower number when people were asked, do you have more moderate PEM or does it occur more often? In multiple sclerosis and major depression, the numbers we were seeing were 52% for MS and 19 to 64% for major depression. And I have some question marks about that, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, there are also several studies where they looked at PEM and they found that it was able to distinguish MECFS from idiopathic chronic fatigue. Um, and idiopathic chronic fatigue is someone who has fatigue but doesn't fit the CUDA criteria. Now the question mark I put in. Um, is because when researchers were asking about PEM, it really matters how they phrase the question. So it's one thing to ask a subject, do you have PEM, do you have post-exertional malaise, and not define it for them. It's another thing to say, okay, this is what PEM is. It's uh, a bunch of symptoms that are exacerbated that can last for this long. It's out of proportion to the trigger. You may get a different answer. 
So the percentages are sort of, there's wiggle room around that. In terms of the prevalence of ME-CFS, um, you know, prevalence of PEM and ME-CFS, that depends on the case definition used as well. Uh, for Facuda, since PM is not a required symptom, you could just by chance have one researcher taking a group of subjects who happen to have more PM, and then another researcher taking another group of subjects randomly, and it could be they have less PM. So the prevalences have to be worked out better, but this is what we have so far. Now, is it important that PEM is unique to ME-CFS? My personal opinion, I don't think it's that important. And this is because when clinicians make a diagnosis, they don't just look at one symptom. They look at the overall picture. And if you go back to any of the case definitions, including the Institute of Medicine's FEID, Systemic Exertion Intolerance Disease case definition, you find that we're looking at more than one symptom. And we also give features that clinicians can use to figure out if the uh, risk of uh, ME-CFS is higher or lower for a particular patient. Okay. So based on all that, all those studies I just went into, the patient reports that we looked at, and the clinician experience, uh, the committee defined PM as worsening of a patient's function and symptoms after exposure to physical or cognitive stressors that were normally tolerated before disease onset. We also talked about prolonged recovery, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, that what we found was supported by objective evidence in the scientific literature. And this is in the IOM Clinician Guide as well as in the book. I'm going to switch gears just a little bit and talk about one way to communicate with your doctor about PEM, with the goal here being that they have a better understanding of what PEM is and specifically its impact on your life. And this is important not just for your treatment but also for any uh, concerns regarding work accommodations and disability. I think most people are aware nowadays that appointment times are pretty short. So if you're lucky, you'll get 15 to 20 minutes for a follow-up visit. So my suggestion is go to these appointments prepared. Uh, take notes, keep a short diary about your symptoms and about your activity level, and describe what triggers your PM, um, what degree of trigger is needed, what are your symptoms, how severe are they, and talk about when they occur, how long they last, and how long it takes you to recover. You may also want to talk about activities that you've avoided or reduced in order to cope with your PEM, or things that you've had to adapt. So for example, if before you're like me and you love to cook, and you cook through the recipe entirely without any problems, but now you're having to cut the vegetables, rest 30 minutes, mix the spices, rest 30 minutes, and then cook it, describe that to your doctor. Make it vivid and make it so that they remember it. This next slide is something I tried to write about PM and banking and an analogy. And if you wish, I can talk about that more later if we have time, or you can look at it on your own. I want to talk a little bit about gaps in the research in PM that I saw. I think the most important one is that regardless of any case definition that is used, SEID, FACUD, or any other, um, we need to research the symptom more. And if it is a case definition that does not require PEM, researchers should consider subgrouping by it. That is, comparing people with PEM to people without PEM to people who are healthy or have other illnesses. In terms of controls, um, we need to look at more than just healthy controls. We need to look at healthy sedentary controls. So that, that way, people cannot just say, oh, the abnormality is due to deconditioning or low activity level and not necessarily to disease. We need to compare CFS to look-alike illnesses, whether it be depression, fibromyalgia, or, um, other, or other diseases like that. Researchers need to ask subjects about symptoms, and not just fatigue. In some studies, I saw people asking about post-exertional fatigue, and they seem to conflate that with post-exertional malaise. And since PM is more than fatigue, they should ask about more than fatigue. It's also important that some studies look at asking patients open-ended questions. So not predetermined questions of what the researcher thinks is PEM, but what the patients think is PEM. More studies need to be looked at timing, the onset of PEM, the course, how long it lasts. The majority of studies I looked at, uh, the duration they looked at was only within two days after an activity level. But we know from talking to patients that 
p.m. can last much longer than two days. And then we need to look at do people have p.m. that's different when they're early on in their illness versus later on in their illness? That's a longitudinal study. I've talked about some objective measures, repeated exercise testing, cognitive performance test, activity monitored, but we can also look at things like neuroimaging or immune functioning. And the other important piece of this is to link objective testing to symptoms and not just look at symptoms by themselves versus objective measures by themselves. Last point, most of the studies that I looked at and the committee looked at were based in uh, the subjects were Caucasian uh, women who were middle aged. Well, they're not the only people who get MECFS, as we know. There need to be more studies in men and children, in non-Caucasian minorities, and in uh, community-based settings, and not just as much as, you know, I think it's important, university-based settings or tertiary care clinics. And that's really important for treatment as well, because we know from other medical conditions that a treatment that works for one group may not work as well or even be harmful for another group. So I've said a lot, and if you get nothing else from this talk, just remember these five points. The first, lack of unclear or diverse definitions of PEM in the past might have led to neglect and confusion, especially among mainstream clinicians and researchers. Second, the Institute of Medicine Committee, we define PEM based on clinician, patient, and researcher input put together. Third, the triggers, symptoms, timing, and commonality of PEM in CFS are pretty distinctive. And people with CFS, based on the evidence we have to date, appear to react differently to exertion compared to healthy and other sick people. Fourth, when you're talking about PEM to other people, you may want to emphasize some of these differences um, to help them better understand what PEM is. And fifth, more and higher quality research is urgently needed for this symptom. I want to thank everyone here for attending and for your attention, and I want to thank the uh, SOG CFS initiative for giving me a chance to talk to all of you.